How come we're not seeing this live like we normally do? Well, some of you may already know, and some of you may not know. But this week, Pastor Bielenberg and I, your two pastors, was in close contact with someone that was a confirmed positive case of COVID. And so we couldn't get tested uh, fast enough in time, and so we had to cancel our in-person service. But we put together this uh, uh, online service so that we could still worship together, those of you at, uh, at home, and all of us as one body, in Christ, and so let's begin our service together. We make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Isaiah in the 40th chapter. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Is it he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to dwell in? Who brings princes to nothing, and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stems taken root in the earth, when he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, said the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them by 
all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run, not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our epistle reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. For if I preach the gospel that gives no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I will have a reward. But when not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel? For though I am free from all, I have not made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became one as outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some, I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
And now let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, children. This is Pastor Lee. I'm sorry that we can't be in person to do the children's message, but I got something here for you guys. And so, what do you think this is? What do you guys think this is? Now, some of you may know what this is. Some of you might be too young to even know what this is. But you know, when your mom and your dad drives, they have to put gas into the car to make the car go. That's called gas or fuel. It gives the car power. And so whenever you start to run out of gas, this is what your mom and dad is going to see on their dashboard in the car. It's going to go to E. E means empty. And so when you run out of gas, you got to go to the gas station and you got to put more gas into the car. Your mom and dad does that so that it will become F, full. F is for full, E is for empty. So when it's empty, you need more power, more fuel. And some of you might be like, wow, well, we don't understand that. You know, that's only for our mom and dad. Well, maybe something else will help you understand. Okay. Some of you guys know what, what is this? Oh, I bet you guys know what this is. That's right. This is a, what is it? It's a tablet. And what happens when you have a tablet? You go on there and you know how to touch everything and you know how to go find all your games on YouTube and all those different things that you love. But what happens when you're on it for too long and you run out of power? And you're like, oh, mom, dad, I'm out of power. And you gotta go find power. You know, my grandkids, when they're at home, and they know I have chargers in my room. So when they come to me, they're like, Papa, we're out of battery. And they grab my charger, they grab my charger, and they plug it in. But where is it at? They plug it in, and then they leave it there, and they're like, we'll be back. And they come back later because they need to charge it to give it more power. And so we heard in our, in our gospel reading today about Jesus and his disciples and they went to the town with his disciples and, and people were bringing to Jesus people who were sick, people who had diseases, who had people who were demon possessed, and Jesus healed them. And it said early in the morning, Jesus got up and he went and he prayed. Before it was morning, before the light came out, he went to a, a desolate place, he went to a place that was quiet so that he could pray. Even all the things that Jesus did, you know, he had to go and talk to pray to God the Father so that he can power up again. Not that he can power up physically, but to power up spiritually. And for us, that's what we do too. When we read God's word, when we pray to God, we power up. We power up by the Holy Spirit that God's given us so that we can continue to love him, to love our neighbors, and to believe in God. So I want you guys to remember that, okay? The next time you charge your iPad, think about prayer and think about how you charge up your spirit for the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for all the beautiful, beautiful uh, wonderful children at home. And I pray that we continue to, to uh, work together, to love you together, and to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you guys next week. Bye now. Thank you.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. While I was thinking about this idea of being all things to all people, I was trying to think of someone who would be a good example, besides Paul and Jesus, of course. The best example I could think of was a character from Harper Lee's novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. His name is Atticus Finch, and he's a Southern attorney who most of us can only picture as Gregory Peck, who played him in the movie. Atticus is beloved in literature and on the big screen because he was a man who sought justice above everything else. He treated all people as people who were worthy of his attention. It didn't matter who they were. He loved and cared about all of them, his children, his housekeeper, his neighbors, the judge on the bench, uh, even the man that he was defending, the man who was falsely accused. We wonder if a man so noble could really exist outside of literature, outside of fiction. In his first letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells what he's been up to as he is taking, as he's preaching the gospel for the sake of Jesus. He says he will do whatever it takes to win more people for the gospel of Christ. He says, to the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Another noble man. Not a nobleman, not someone who's going to lord it over other people, as people with a title or a little power might be wont to do. Paul had been a Jew, a Jew among Jews. He knew the Old Testament scriptures inside and out. When Christ took hold of him on the road to Damascus, something happened to him that would change his life forever. The man who had spent his life hunting down Christians and enjoying that would now be spending his life proclaiming Jesus Christ crucified for sinners, proclaiming Jesus as the only Lord of his life. In case anyone doubted his sincerity, Paul gives us all that we need to know to know that he's our man, how, he is willing to, how far he's willing to go to be all things to all people. He says Paul can be a Hebrew if he needs to. He can be an Israelite if he needs to. He can be a descendant of Abraham if he needs to. He can be a servant of Christ if the Lord can use it. He's been imprisoned, he's been flogged, he's been exposed to death, he's been beaten, he's shipwrecked on the open sea, constantly on the move, he's in danger from his own countrymen, he says, who wanted to kill him and in danger of the Gentiles. He's gone without food, he's gone without decent clothing, and on top of all these pressures was the daily concern he had for all the churches that he was planting in the name of Jesus. Finally, he says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Paul had a gift. He could be all things to all people. He could talk to the highest ruler of the land, and before the day was over, he might very possibly be talking to the man who was in chains in the prison beside him. He wasn't talking about the weather. He wasn't talking about the Vikings. They hadn't even gotten to Norway yet, much less to Minneapolis. He didn't talk about the recipe that you just have to try. No, Paul had one thing that he had to talk about, and he spelled it out way at the beginning of this letter to the Corinthians. He said, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. All things to all people. In that category, Atticus Finch and the Apostle Paul pale in comparison to Jesus Christ. He is like us in every way, yet without sin. The word tells us he was born of a woman, born under the law, that he might fulfill the law for us. So Christ is conceived, and he's born into the world. He will walk it just as we do. Jesus knows what we face. He knows our moments of joy and celebration. He knows our temptations, and he knows our despairs. And in all of these things, he comes to us as God in the flesh, as God walking beside us, Emmanuel, God with us, to remind us that we do not walk through this world all alone. Even when we grow old and we're the last member of our family left, even when no one is allowed to come and hold our hand in the hospital, we may be alone. But because of Jesus, we're never truly alone. 
The good news is that Jesus doesn't wait for people to get where they should be in their lives. If he did that, that would be kind of like the first responders telling us, well, let us know when the heart pains are over and then we'll come. No, Jesus is all things to all people all along. He comes to us wherever we are, whatever situation we're in, whatever condition our life might be, and he starts there at that point. Sometimes someone has to hit rock bottom before they realize that they need what Jesus has been offering them all along. Forgiveness, unconditional love, understanding, a relationship with a father may, they may have never known here on this earth. Brothers and sisters who are more like a family to them than their own flesh and blood. I never thought that I would see a box of rubber gloves sitting on the altar for us to use for communion. I never really thought that I'd have a great big bottle of hand sanitizer uh, in the cup holder in my car. But it's 2021. We're doing all these things to keep clean and to keep other people clean. Unlike us, Jesus was never afraid to get his hands dirty for the right reason. When Jesus does what's unthinkable in his time, when he reaches out and he touches a leper, the infection doesn't come to him, but his cleanness goes to the leper. Power flows from Jesus to the sick like forgiveness flows to a sinner. He comes to Simon Peter's mother-in-law, he takes her by the hand, and he lifts her up, and her fever left her. When he invites himself to lunch at the house of Zacchaeus, the crowds push right up to the tax collector's dining room so Jesus can hear them mutter, he's gone in to eat with sinners, as if Jesus doesn't know completely what they're thinking already. Jesus touches the dead, and instead of becoming unclean, the dead come back to life. Finally, Jesus goes out to die with criminals, sharing their nakedness, sharing their shame, their suffering, even though he himself is innocent as a lamb, the lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is all things to all people, all people, good and bad. Evil swirls around Jesus until it brings him to the cross, and somehow he bears it. He takes it all the way to death itself, and he exhausts its power and its control over us once and for all. When he says it is finished, it truly is. Now in our day and age, people do all kinds of things to be all things to all people. This passage has been abused, even in the church. Some of you remember when a guitar in church was radical and it was the end of the world. Preachers have sworn from the pulpit or worn blue jeans to show us just how relevant they are. Some churches in the Twin Cities took down their crosses because they didn't want to offend anyone. And we know the battles over worship style is a very happy distraction the devil gives to us to take our minds off what the real problem is around us. And the fact is, people are dying all around us. As these things come and go, there's one thing that remains the same and must always remain the same, and that's Jesus Christ. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We preach Christ crucified, Paul said. In this day and age, Especially, we can't leave this unspoken. We can't assume that people know it because they don't. While the law of God is written on every heart, the law and that notion of sin still has to be proclaimed. Knowing that the gospel is not native to any people or culture, it belongs to all of us. Every tribe and language and people and language and tongue will gather before the throne of the Lamb. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most inclusive thing that I can think of. And that gospel does not change. Christ crucified and risen from the dead is the only message that we have to offer, no matter how we convey it, no matter to whom. Let's not forget, Paul became all things to all people for the sake of the gospel and for no other reason, for the sake of the gospel. To preach Christ, to do whatever I have to do, that I may win more of them. What you and I call them may ultimately be included in what Paul and Jesus calls us. In today's gospel, Jesus got up early that morning to go out undisturbed and to spend some time with his father. We call that prayer. Jesus takes a hike. He went out to pray. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the disciples woke up, and I'm guessing that people were already showing up at the front door with people who were sick and demons to be cast out. 
the disciples formed a little search party and went out looking for Jesus. They found him, of course, and when they did, they announced what Jesus already knew. Everyone is looking for you. Everyone is looking for you. Well, then Jesus said, we'd better get a move on or something like that. Let's go out to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that's why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, casting out demons. Jesus was all things to all people. Did you hear what the disciples said? Jesus did. Everyone is looking for you. Oh, the good old days, we say, a time when everyone was looking for Jesus. But the thing is, is whether they know it or not, people are still looking for him. They may go through a maze some of you wouldn't believe, and some of you would because you've been in some of those places yourself. You can look for that kind of love in all the wrong places and never find it. You can dodge, you can avoid Jesus, but he will never evade you. He is not going to hide from you. In fact, he comes looking for you. That's the good news. St. Augustine lived a pretty wild life in his younger years. He claimed to have prayed, make me chaste, Lord, but not yet. He drove his poor Christian mother Monica to despair. He drove her to tears. He drove her to her Lord in prayer for years for his sake. When he finally came to his senses, when he came to the faith, he wrote down his life in a book called The Confessions. It's part cautionary tale, but it's part encouragement, and he's written it mostly like prayer. To me, the sweetest thing the father of the early church ever wrote was right there in the very beginning of this book. He writes, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Our hearts are restless, Lord, until they rest in you. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, all things to all people. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, the only place we will find our rest now or ever. In the name of this Jesus, amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, merciful Father, we come before you this day and we thank you for the blessings you give to us as your people. We thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus Christ, who, like the Apostle Paul, is all things to all people. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to see him as our Savior and our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today we rejoice with Aaron and Erica Rowlings at the birth of their son, Mason Aaron, who was born on January 30th. We uh, rejoice along with their grandparents, Eric and Robin. We ask, Lord, that you would watch over them as he grows. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Austin and Maddie Moldenauer at the birth of their son, uh, Brooks Andrew, on February 2nd. And we rejoice with grandparents, Laura and Andy. We ask, Lord, that you would be with these little ones and their family. We look forward to the day when they will be baptized in your name. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us and that you would help us to raise them to your glory. We pray, Lord, also this day a prayer of thanksgiving for your servant, Elaine Steubenberg, as she celebrated her 95th birthday this week. We thank you for the many blessings you've given to her as a faithful wife. We thank you for the daughters and the children and grandchildren she has given, been given. We ask, Lord, that you would continually help her to have that servant heart. We pray that you would be with her as uh, she grows older. We ask that you would surround her with love and care from her family and those from whom she seeks advice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, as you brought your hand of healing to so many people, we ask that you would continue to work that hand among us in our day. We pray for our brother, Lanny Betterman, who has had back surgery. We pray, Lord, that this will be successful we ask that you would be with him and his family as he recuperates in the days ahead and that this would give him relief. We pray, Lord, that you would be with our brother Pete Peter, uh, who had hip surgery at St. John's Hospital. We ask that you would be with him as he recuperates. We ask that you would be with his beloved wife, Helen, uh, who is at home. We ask that you would be with their children as they love them and care for them. We pray that you'd be with Jan Siddiqui's son, Scott, as he anticipates surgery uh, for neck and back pain on Tuesday. 
we ask that you would guide the surgeon's hands and uh, be with Scott as he recuperates. We pray for our sister Marge Nelson, who is at the Estates of Roosevelt, uh, following a stay at the hospital. We ask that you would be with her and Bob in their life together. We also pray for Pastor Lee's sister Nia, who has many health concerns. We pray, Lord, that you would draw her closer to you, that you would uh, reach uh, her with your love and your care, and that you would continue to work your healing power in her life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with all those who fight in the battle with cancer. We pray that you'd be with those that we name aloud and those that we name silently uh, in our own hearts. We pray for Jan Siddiqui's niece, Samantha, as she continues to undergo chemo treatments. We pray for Linda Wood as she continues with treatments as well, that you'd be with the Wasserman's friend, Jason, that you'd be with Ann Curry at home, that you'd be with Sandy Weingarten at home, that you'd be with Pastor Lee's friend, Fia, that you'd be with Paul Eldall and Larry Hexham. Lord, as these people visit doctors, as they seek treatments, as they analyze the, the news, the information that they are given, we pray, Lord, that you would remind them that you walk beside them in this. We pray that you would give them hope. We pray that you would give them remission. We ask that you would help them to accept things that, we're, that are hard for us to understand. We pray, Lord, that you would use us to surround them with your love and your care and your compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for those who are affected and afflicted by COVID-19. We pray for Jim Lindsay and his wife Marion as he fights COVID in Sheboygan. We pray that you would be with our brother Nicholas Wimmer, uh, who has been diagnosed with COVID and is at home. We pray that you would be with him and his family as they are quarantined. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with those who are being tested. We pray that you would be with those uh, who wait for that, those who are quarantined. We pray for all of our students, our parents, our teachers and administrators. Uh, we thank you that we have had 100 days of school here at the King of Kings this year. We pray, Lord, that you would be with those who grieve the loss of loved ones. We pray for those who are working hard to distribute the vaccine. We pray for all of our healthcare workers who work around the clock. We pray for senior living staff as they give encouragement to those who are lonely and distressed. We pray for our governor, we pray for our president, we pray for all legislators. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us in this great difficulty and that you would help us to know that you walk beside us in it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, because you rose from the dead, you give us comfort and strength even as we face the death of those we love. Today we ask that you would continue to be with Cassidy and Harper and Elliot Schweer as they grieve the loss of their husband and father, Matt. We ask that you would watch over them and that you would protect them and that you would remind them that there is a place for them in your kingdom too. We ask that you'd be with Sebastian and Lucy at the death of his great grandmother. We thank you for all the blessings you gave to her during her earthly life. And we ask now that you would give them comfort and hope in the promise of the resurrection. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with Ryan and Deanna Browning and their family at the death of Deanna's father, Philip. We ask that you would be with his wife, Julie, that you would be with their daughters, that you'd be with Deanna and Ryan and their family, and that you would comfort them in the days ahead. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all those who grieve, that you would wipe away their tears with your own hand, and that you would point them to the resurrection that you've prepared for all believers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. 
Well, brothers and sisters, I hope that uh, today's worship and today's message has inspired you, has lifted you up, and has given you hope. Continue to pray for one another and continue to pray that the Holy Spirit guides us in our life. And we hope to see you this Sunday and pray that Pastor Dilberg and I will have good results on our tests. And we'll see you soon. Bye now.